But um, we are going to interrupt everything right now because we got him right here. Um, Marty Biron is with us. <laughs> and uh, yes. Marty, first off, great to see you. Um, always one of my favorite analysts on TV. And um, also that I'm a member of the 43 Club, too. So um. I like that. I see that in the background. That looks really good. So I'm uh, happy to join you guys. I'm in my car right now. Sorry, I don't have a better uh, studio background just because I've been running around doing uh, errands. And I'm like, hey, I got to pull over. I got to take the time. Let's do it. <laughs> no, no worries. My background is pretty plain. So you, you got a better background than me. <laughs> So, All right, Anthony, uh, why don't you start us off? Yeah, so, Marty, thanks for joining us. I guess let's kick it off with the most hot, hot topic right now is Jack Eichel. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on the process so far? Where, where do you see this going? Um, you know, do you see him being a saber come training camp? You know, how does this marriage end? Well, I'll tell you this. I've said it from the beginning that it was going to be a long and very complicated process. Um, everybody was saying, no, a trade is eminent, a trade is eminent. I was always like, I just don't see it. And just because, um, you know, number one, it's hard to make trades in this economic landscape in the National Hockey League with top end players, with $10 million players. We saw Mark andre Fleury being traded from Vegas to Chicago for basically nothing. I mean, there's a prospect, but it was for nothing. So that makes it very hard for teams to acquire a big contract. Uh, but Jack Eichel is a top five, top 10 player in the National Hockey League. So you need a return. You need to be able to get something back. Um, and it better be good for the Sabres to set themselves moving forward if you were to make that move. So uh, I, I think it's a very complicated uh, transaction to make. I think you add that with the neck uh, injury and, you know, what is the the – the approach to, to make Jack better, um, I think it just becomes very complicated. So Kevin Adams is doing what he has to do. He's taking his time and looking at all the options. Uh, and that's why we are in August right now. And there's still nothing done because it's going to take some time if it ends up getting done at some point. I, and it's still a big if in my mind. Sure. Marty, do you think it gets to a point where Kevin Adams says the, the returns simply aren't good enough and he explores the idea of retaining some of Jack Eichel's salary? Look, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what that conversation with the general managers are uh, going to be. Uh, but I'll tell you this, uh, you know, uh, if I am sitting as a general manager and I have an asset and a player – like a Jack Eichel or, you know, I mean, put all those players that are in that same category and I'm looking to acquire assets. I don't think there's any salary being retained. Now it could be, and maybe Kevin Adams is going to have to be creative in that way. Uh, but your ultimate goal is to be able to trade a player if you have to, or if that's what you want to do and get pieces in return. Uh, we're seeing it like the Sabres traded Sam Reinhardt to Florida. They traded Rasmus Ristolainen to Philadelphia. Uh, they didn't retain any salary in the Rasmus Ristolainen trade. Sam Reinhardt doesn't have a contract moving forward this right now because he's an RFA. So he's going to have to sign. So there was no salary retention possible there. But even with Risto, uh, a lot of people were saying, well, if they traded Rasmus Ristolainen, there's got to have to be some salary retained by the Sabres. There was none. Um, that's just the way it is. Like if you... Uh, really want a player, and if you're a team that really wants a player, you you have to get that player, and you have to get that old contract. Now, most of the times when you see salary retention, it's because, and eh, you know, that player has had some issues injury-wise or performance-wise, and you're trying to facilitate a trade. Um, I don't think that the Sabres are trying to facilitate a Jack Eichel trade with anybody. I think they're saying, if I, anything... You guys out there that want Jack mm -hmm. Eichel, you're going to facilitate the offer towards us. That's really the way I think it's it's coming down to. Marty, do you think that they got a fair return so far for uh, Bristo and uh, Reinhardt? And if that if the answer is no on that, that's the reason why there's even more pressure to make the home run on the Eichel trade. Now, listen, I, I would say general managers have to look at a transaction as individual transaction. 
And and I don't think they look at it as we won or lost or whatnot. And then, oh, well, we better win the next one because we lost the last one. They don't do that. They they look at what's going to make their team better. And they try to, to, to achieve just that. Now, I really like the Rasmus Ristolainen trade. I thought that was great. They got a first round pick in last year in this past draft, uh, which gave them two first rounder. Uh, they got Robert Hag. Uh, I, they got a pick later. I really like it. I thought that was great return for Risto. Uh, Risto is still a really good player in the National Hockey League. He's still young. He's got big, strong, uh, big shot. He can put up some offensive numbers. And Philly is revamping their blue line. So they, they wanted to facilitate a trade and they made it happen. The difference between the wrist line and return and the Sam Reinhardt return comes down to the contract. Sam Reinhardt needs to sign a contract, and that contract may be in the seven plus million dollars. You know, and so Florida saying, hey, listen, you know, we we were willing to take Sam Reinhardt in a trade, but it's a lot of money. And we're helping you, Buffalo, by taking in that seven plus million dollars. So the return for Sam Reinhardt. A trade was not as much as a lot of people thought it was going to be because you have to factor in the money that Florida is going to have to pay. If Sam Reinhardt had been signed with two more years left at $5.5 million, that return would have been way higher. But it's not the case. So Devin Levi is a really, really good goalie prospect. Uh, people in Florida know that they have have – multiple prospects in Florida. Spencer Knight is one of them. And Devin Levi was a goalie for Team Canada, the World Juniors, uh, and yep. we all got to see him. Kind of a late bloomer, but he's a really good goalie prospect. So that's that's good because you can draft a goalie, but you don't really know what you're going to get out of that goaltender, right? Like Devin Levi was like a seventh-round draft pick, uh, and and they yep. like now you know what kind of prospect he's going to be. So that replaces a draft pick that may be – you would want to use, uh, and uh, you got to pick as well. So I, I think that's that's really – that was a good return. I think people are saying, well, maybe you could have gotten more, but I, I break it down, and I think that's a good return. Uh, Mari, more on the, on the positive side of this for the Sabres, they drafted Owen Power first overall. Um, I believe yep. before he was drafted, I read I read something that he was maybe going to go back to Michigan. Uh, do you think he's going to play for the Sabres this fall, or do you think he's going to go back to Michigan for another year? And personally, I would want him to go back to Michigan. Uh, and there's different uh, scenarios and circumstances for that. Did you guys see what Michigan's going to look like next year? <laughs> it's going to well, be yes. a yes. powerhouse, right? <laughs> Matt Bernier, yeah. Ken Johnson, uh, Hughes on defense. Yeah. They have a, a goalie prospect for the Sabres, Eric Portillo, in that. It's going to be his first year starting at Michigan. He was there last year. I, I look at that team, and you can give Owen Power that experience of being on probably the number one ranked team in college hockey, having a chance to win a national championship. And either get that experience of winning or not. Like having to be that number one team and maybe they fail along the way and you learn from that. Maybe they win and you learn from that. So I really believe that uh, the direction the Sabres are taking right now, they're in a rebuilding mode. They're getting younger. Uh, and maybe the approach of having Owen Power go back to Michigan is the better approach. Now, here's the thing. A number one overall pick usually wants to sign their contracts yes. right away, right? But college players can't. Like, if it was an OHL guy or a, you know, a Quebec Major Junior Hockey League guy or a European guy, you could sign them and send them back to juniors. Or you can sign them and say, stay in Europe for a year. But college hockey players can't sign their contracts and then stay in college. So that's the one thing that's going to be a little bit uh, tough for Owen Power is thinking – Am I gambling this moving forward and say I'm going to sign my contract at the end of the hockey season mm -hmm. or should I sign it right now and turn pro? So that's the only thing that could muddy the water. Marty, speaking of learning experiences, what did you think of Owen Power's performance at the World Championships? Uh, it was unbelievable. It was – listen, they did not do good in the first uh, few games and they looked really, really uh, uh, sluggish and, and maybe there's uh, there's a reason for that. Not a lot of – People traveled overseas in the pandemic and you got to get your legs going and they're in Latvia and all of that. 
Uh, but I, I had a chance to talk to Jared Gallant and, you know, new Rangers coach, but uh, I talked to him about a one power at the world championship. And he said, the more responsibility I gave him, the better he responded. And so now you're getting down, like you're winning a few games and you're like, wow, this kid's really good. Let's give him end of, uh, uh, of uh, period shifts. Let's get, let's give him end of game shifts. Let's give him more responsibility. And he really responded and looked good. The size is there. We all can see the size is there. He's got decent skating. I would say above average skating, especially for a guy that size. He's got some really good uh, offensive instincts uh, that he'll develop probably playing college again and being able to dominate in the college ranks. So I, I thought he was really good. And you don't see that often. A college kid, a 17-year-old, uh, maybe an 18-year-old uh, kid going to the World Championship and playing that well. I went to the World Championship. And it was a lot of veterans, a lot of older players that, uh, that enjoyed the process. There wasn't a lot of young players. There was one my year, and his name is Jay Bomeister. And he was defenseman yeah. of the tournament. And that was kind of his coming out party. He was in Florida at the time. The Panthers weren't doing really that great. And then all of a sudden, Jay Bomeister at the World Championship looked really good. I kind of look at Owen Power as the same thing. Like, he went to the World Championship with no expectation. And by the end of it, he was like, wow, look at this player, right? So um, maybe it's the same thing that happened with when the Bo Meester, uh we were playing together. That's going back to 2003 World Championship when we won gold in, uh, in Finland. Morning. I'm going to pivot to uh, your, your former teammate, uh, Chris Drury. How do you think yeah. he's done um, – like revamping the Rangers this off season. Well, number one, he's, he's done some great work. Uh, you know, I love drew. I think he's a, he's a smart person. He's a, he's a competitor. Um, so I met him when he first came to the Buffalo Sabres, right? So he went from Colorado to Calgary and then he came to the Buffalo Sabres and he brought that winning attitude. He brought that pedigree, that, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that culture, right? He, he looked around the locker rooms and there was no pictures of the Stanley Cup, not one. And he goes, what are, play what are we playing for? Like we're playing for the cup. There should be pictures of the Stanley Cup in, in the in the room somewhere, in the weight room. Like you're you're on the bench press, you're pumping iron. You want to see what you're pumping iron for, right? So he brought that culture. And so now I look at the Rangers, and obviously there were some really tough decisions to make. Uh, you know, he made some trades. Uh, but he did sign, obviously, uh Gaudreau and now Reeves. Um, to, I, I don't want to say to answer to Tom Wilson, but it's to bring that grit uh, and that aspect of the game, just like the Tampa Bay Lightning did, and it brought them two cups. Like, the Tampa Bay Lightning did not look at the Columbus Blue Jackets and say, we need to respond to Nick Foligno, and we need to list, respond to Josh Anderson, and we need to respond to John Tortorella. Like they said, if we want to compete and win – four rounds in the playoffs and win the cup, we need a different sand and sandpaper aspect to our game that they didn't have at the time. So they got Barkley Goodrow, they got Blake Coleman, they got Pat Maroon, they got Yanni Gord. Well, they had Yanni Gord, but he, he got a better role. And so then the results were there. And the league, as you guys know, the NHL is a bit of a copycat league. Somebody does something well and the results are there. And then you're like, oh, I got to do the same thing a little bit, right? So I think that's what Chris Drury is looking at is what do we have as a team? The Rangers were one of the highest scoring team in the second half of the season last year. Yeah, they did score nine goals against Philly or whatnot, and it helps. But Zabanajad, Panarin, uh, Lafreniere was better. Philip Hedl was back. He was better. So I'm looking at that team. And now what do you need? You need a little bit of sandpaper, and Chris Drury was able to acquire that. So, Marty, before uh, before we let you go, I got to ask you this question. So, the guys above me are Ranger fans. I I'm the Islander fan of the group. Um, being that you played <laughs> goalie, <laughs> you played goalie for both our teams. Um, talking about Ilya Sorokin and Igor Shosturkin, you know they've been best friends. They've dominated the KHL. Um, how are they similar? You know, how are they different? And, and what are you looking forward to both of them as they continue their careers next season? 
in my opinion, they're extremely, extremely different. Shesterkin is a very athletic, uh, very quick reflex type of goaltender. Um, I remember when he got called up from Hartford and he came up to the New York Rangers, I watched a couple of games on TV. I wanted to see what he was all about because he was burning the league in the AHL. And he made a couple of saves on deflections that I'm like, oh, how did he get his glove out there? How did he get his blocker out there? Like he just was really a quick reacting type of goaltender. I love his game. I think he's excellent. I think he's a stud. Uh, Sorokin on the other side is, I believe, more of a technical goaltender, relies more on positioning. Um, he's, he's got quickness, obviously. You're, you're playing the National Hockey League. You have to have quickness, but not on the Shesterkin level. So he's got to do things a little differently. I was really surprised, I have to say, in the playoffs last year when Barry Trotz kept going back to Simeon Varlamov yeah. because I thought Sorokin played extremely well. <laughs> and I think that comp competition is going to just get enhanced even more next year. And then the Islanders are going to have to make a decision. A little bit like the Rangers at Shesterkin and Georgiev kind of battling, battling, and then Shesterkin took the lead. I want to see if Sorokin can take that lead with the New York Islanders. Uh, but Barry Trotz is the type of coach that likes to trust his veterans a little bit more. You mm -hmm. can... You know, criticize the Leo Komarov usage and protecting the <laughs> yeah. in, the, in the expansion draft. Like, but but that's what uh, Barry Trotz does, and that's why he's had success. So I'm not going to criticize that, but I think Sorokin's a really good goalie. Uh, but I think Shesterkin is a step above, in in my opinion. You, you just gave me some PTSD with Komarov on the first line. That was <laughs> I shook my head at that. PTSD yes, going your that. way. They didn't have Anders yeah. Lee, right? So now you're not yeah. trying to mess up all your lineup. With Anders Lee in the lineup, uh, look out. I think this team is is much different and really, really good. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for your input, Marty. I, I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, for the Sabres' sake and both New York teams, they can have success next season. So that, that would be real great. That would be awesome. I can't wait to uh, see fans uh, – in all arenas, just like they were in uh, Cali at the end of the year with the Islanders. That mm -hmm. was fun. And now moving to Belmont. I can't wait to see that building. And obviously, MSG is one of the best ranked to play in. Yeah. Well, you know, there was, what, like 1,500 fans, 2,000 fans or whatnot. The place sounded so loud. So um, <laughs> I can't wait to see the place full out, like buzzing like it used to. Yeah. yeah. And, and awesome. also, Marty, if I, if I must say, Man, do you have one of the greatest voices for this business. So. <laughs> oh, thanks. I, I absolutely hate my voice. Every time I hear myself talk, I'm like, God oh, damn it. I think, I think, my mind thinks I don't have an accent. I'm like, I, and then I listen to myself again, and I'm like, oh, you sound like a broken French record, right? But I don't know what's anyway, so. <laughs> uh, That's awesome. Uh. That's awesome. Well, it's, it's, it's music to our ears. Yeah. I can tell you well, that. Well, guys, I appreciate you uh, having me on. Uh, enjoy the rest of the summer. Enjoy next season. Uh, it's going to be fun to see that that battle, Rangers, Islanders, and uh, hopefully not too many fights in the stands. I know it's entertaining yes. for everybody, but uh, stay uh, stay safe, everybody. <laughs> don't, don't get yourself hurt. Out no. No. Well, you two, especially on top of one another, don't fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll try not to. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much, Marty. Marty. Thanks a lot, Marty. Okay. Thanks, guys. Yeah, have a good one. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. right. Wow. Oh, yeah. That was awesome. Great. He, he is, he's fantastic. And like I said, oh, you, my God. you just hear great. Marty Marty Buran's voice and then you go and I got – uh, I, I know I'm listening to hockey right now. That's what I know. Yeah. Just, you know what's funny is he, uh, out of all the interviews that I think that me and Anthony did, I, I think that might have to be my favorite one. Yeah, it was. He was, was hilarious. Good. He was great. He yeah. really was. Yeah. And you could just tell he was having fun doing this. He, he, you can tell that he, he, we weren't <laughs> like bothering him. He just, he was just great. He really was. If you like that video, we got a lot more. So check out any of these that are right over here. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Mm, your ideas are intriguing to me, and I wish to subscribe to your newsletter. <laughs>